amazing it is that we're called his friend this morning. That's so awesome to me. I love coming to church and I love worshiping and I, I love singing these songs and the message that these songs sing. And, and I love singing them not just because the words make you feel good or because, you know, the lyrics are cool or whatever, but because there's power in these lyrics because we're singing about God and he's powerful and what he did for us and just how he loves us. And I just think it's so amazing. So I want you to just think of that today as we just continue to worship him.
the fire I'll not be burned You're standing with me When surrounded by trials I will rejoice Your love sets me free All along you have been so faithful All along you have been Within my heart And here's a melody That was not taught And in the darkest night It still goes on The anthem of my God Within my heart And here's a treasure that cannot be bought when all else is faded it will not the presence of my God and no magnify the Lord let us exalt his name to Before your throne And in the mystery That can be known Lives the majesty That's yours alone How glorious
you give the Lord praise this morning. He's worthy to be praised. Something about being in his presence. He said, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in your midst. Amen. Just open up your hearts to him this morning. Boy, we, we just have the opportunity, not really so much a responsibility, but an opportunity to come into his presence and worship him. I've had people ask me before, say, man, why does, God, why does God want me to worship him? Is he like on some cosmic, eternal ego trip that he really needs my worship? He doesn't, he doesn't need our worship. It's not for his benefit, but it's for our benefit. When we open up our hearts to give him praise, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And as we lift him up this morning, as we open our hearts to bless his name and to worship him, our hearts are then open to receive from him what we need. Amen. Turn to about three people this morning and say, you look like you need help. <laughs> and you're, you're at the right place. Amen. Just continue to worship him this morning. Allow his presence just to fill every area of your life. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is my. This is my daily bread. Your very word spoken to me. And I I'm just before you.
lost without you. I'm lost without you. This is the air I breathe. This is the Praise this morning as you are as you are being reseated. I'm going to be glad today to be in the house of the Lord. Just stand right there, Latrice. I can't see me. All right. <laughs> it is good. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. We can't shake hands and uh, hug it out like we used to, but turn around and wave to about three or four people <laughs> this morning. <laughs> and... Uh, Although, uh, although perhaps we have to, we have to uh, maintain our physical spaces uh, and our social distancing, but yet, uh, aren't you thankful this morning that uh, regardless of our background and who we are and what our last name is and all that stuff, we're, we're joined together by His love, and I'm so thankful, I'm thankful for His love and His mercy. Uh, some people, some people uh, want justice. I don't want justice. I, I need mercy. <laughs> I need help today. I need mercy. I'm thankful. I'm thankful for his, his grace. So thank you so much for, for being here today. If you're a visitor here, it's your first time. Uh, if you see the, the kind of a small petite guy in the back, Jim, wave at everybody. Uh, if you are a visitor this morning, uh, if you'll see Jim, he'll hand you a coffee cup. And we got just a little gift. And if you have been attending for a short period of time and you didn't get a coffee cup, uh, Feel free. Don't be now. Those of you that attend all the time, don't be going back there trying to get a bunch of coffee cups, put putting them on eBay or something like that, because we are we're watching you. We're on to you. But even more than that, the Lord is uh, Lord is watching. <laughs> so we're uh, we're starting a new series, and the name of the series is called Kiss. Amen. Well, we can't do that anymore because you never know who's got the who's got the Rona, but. Uh, we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about KISS. Some of you are thinking, all right, the rock band. You need to start reading your Bible more. We're not going to talk about the rock band here this morning. Uh, so uh, for the next few Sundays, I want to read Matthew chapter 18 and read a couple of verses there starting with verse 2. This is talking about Jesus and calling to him a child he put, he put them in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you. This is, now, I want you to really focus in on this verse this morning because this is where we're going to camp out for a few minutes. Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. I heard a story a while back about a young guy that he was, it was his first church and he was going to preach his first sermon at the church. And his wife went up there and she left a little note up there and all it said was kiss. And he stepped there and he realized, he recognized his wife's handwriting. He thought, that is so nice of her. She put she, she left a little kiss up there for me on the, on the little platform or podium that they had in that church. And he was so inspired that he just got up there and he just kept preaching and preaching and preaching. And afterwards at lunch, he was so excited, you know, he, he thought everything went well. And he asked his wife at lunch, said, honey, how do you think, how do you think I did? And he said, she said, well, you, you went a little bit long. You didn't get my note? He said, I did. And he said, I was so touched that you would leave me a kiss on the platform and she said no that's not what that meant that meant keep it short stupid <laughs> so uh so so we're, we're going to talk about we're going to talk about kiss this morning but we're not going to talk about keeping it short stupid we're going to say keep it simple stupid i don't even like the word stupid i, I don't want to be calling anyone here stupid 
So uh, my granddaughter, when she was about three or four, Presley, uh, she's all up in my business all the time. And uh, she's, uh, I think she's eight years old now. She's eight going on 25. And like every other woman in my life, she is trying to be the boss of me. And I mean, uh, whenever I'm around her, if I'm at her house, she bosses me. If she comes to my house, she bosses me. And that little child, I love her, but she's sort of getting on my nerves just a little bit. So uh, she was at the house one time, and, and her and Ryder were acting kind of crazy, and, and I used the word stupid. And she, she stopped me. She's about four years old. She stopped me and said, Gee, Paul, we don't say the word stupid. That's a bad word. So uh, Presley's not in here this morning, but some of you tattletales will run and tell her. So we're not going to say, we're not going to use the word stupid there. I was trying to think of another S word we, <laughs> we could use. And the best I could come up with, since we are in South Texas, we're going to use keep it simple, senor. How about that? <laughs> or senora. Or sen hey, Ernie woke up. Amen. God bless you. God bless you, Ernie. One of these days you're going to get saved. So. But he said, I'm Baptist, so I, once I was saved, I'm always saved. So we're not going to. Well, KISS is actually an acronym that was used by uh, the United States Navy. And it was, uh, we've got some Navy guys here, man. How many Navy guys we have? Any military people here? Any, any vets here? Hey, man, let's, all right. We ought to give these guys, uh, man. Man, that's, we, we, we appreciate you guys. We appreciate you guys so much. Um, but in 1960, the U.S. Navy came up with a program, and they used the acronym KISS, which meant keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> keep it, but here at Crossroads, keep it simple, senor. That's how we're going to say it. And the KISS principle states that most systems work best if they are kept simple rather than made complicated. Therefore, simplicity should be a key goal in design, and unnecessary complexity should be avoided. Now, I absolutely love this concept uh, when it comes to following Jesus. So over the next few weeks, we're going to look at the simplicity of following Jesus. And, and when this gets a hold of you, you know, it's so funny because if I ask you this morning, who was Jesus? We probably would, you know, if you were uh, if you're a Baptist, you probably, well, Jesus was Baptist. Or if you're a Pentecostal, well, Jesus was a Pentecostal. Or I'm going to tell you something. Jesus wasn't a Baptist. Jesus wasn't a Pentecostal. Jesus wasn't a charismatic. Jesus wasn't a non-denominational. <laughs> Jesus wasn't a Catholic. Jesus was a Jewish rabbi. I got some more news for you. Jesus wasn't a white guy either. Jesus came from a part of the world where he would have been a person of color and then spent the first two years of his life in northern Africa among the black folks. Amen. Jesus was not a Republican. Jesus was not a Democrat. Jesus is not who you and I prefer him to be. He is the Son of God. He is the King of all kings. He is the Lord of all lords. He is my Savior. He's my Redeemer. He's my healer. And he is our soon coming King. Amen. And there, it, it's, it's, it's a revolutionary. It, it's, it's, a, it's freeing yourself when you just come into the simplicity of, of learning what it means to be a follower of Jesus. It can have a revolutionary effect upon the lives of those that are presently his followers and those that are seeking him. I've been a, I've been a pastor for a while now, and I've found that there's a real disconnect with a lot of folks. Most folks don't really have a problem. Some will, some, some do, because, <laughs> you know, if Jesus was here today, I know the Republicans would rally. Oh, Jesus would be, he'd be at the Republican conventions. And the Democrats, oh, no, he was for the poor. He'd be at the Democratic conventions. I kind of have a feeling it would be the same way today as it was 2,000 years ago. I think he'd aggravate all of us. There's a reason why they crucified him. Now, you think about this. The most loving, the most kind, the most gracious person, a person of grace, a person of mercy, a, a person of love, and yet they crucified him. Why? Because he stood for truth. And we're so busy trying to form and fashion him according to our preferences and according to our ethnicity and according to our political persuasions that we fail to see who Jesus really is. And there's something about his words. Somebody has wisely observed that his words 
will bring us comfort when we are disturbed. I can't tell you how many times I've been broken and defeated and discouraged. And I open his word and I read it and it brings comfort. It brings hope. It brings peace. It gives me direction. God's word will change your life. But someone has also wisely observed that sometimes when we read his word, he comforts the afflicted and sometimes his words afflict the comfortable. His word will get all up in your business, people. His word will totally, (laughs) Jesus will totally wreck your life. Because we want him to come into our life and just affirm my lifestyle the way it is and leave me the way that I am and bless me the way that I am. But oh no, he loves us too much. You wives, you got your hands, your, your, your hands full with that guy that you're married to. You're doing your best to raise him, to potty train him, you know, to, <laughs> to teach him how. <laughs> you, got, you got your hands full with him. But you know, guys, your wife does that because she loves you. She's trying to get you to grow up and be a man. <laughs> oh, keep it short, stupid. Keep it, shut up, Donald. Okay, listen. <laughs> But there's something, about, there's something about his work in our lives. He will wreck us he will, because he, he does that because he loves us. And he wants us not to conform in the image of this world and the spirit of this world, but in, according to his spirit and, and the spirit of God and, and of his word. When Jesus said, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Can you grasp a message and experience so simple that a child can understand and receive? But, you know, we all, have, we all come from different backgrounds. And I love that. I love that about our church. We all come from different backgrounds. We've had folks, uh, I, I know a, a few years ago, and, and these folks have, have, have uh, some of them have moved on, uh, moved out of state. Uh, my jokes got so bad, they said they didn't just leave Aransas Pass. They left the state of Texas. And they moved because of job situation, but we sat and we received in, into membership uh, two Presbyterians, a Catholic, and, and a woman whose husband had been a Lutheran pastor, but they just loved Jesus and they loved his word. And, and that's the thing that we're pursuing, the simplicity of what it means to really follow Jesus without being burdened down with, with a lot of rituals and traditions that are man-made. How many of you know that denominations are man-made? And let me just be quick to add this. I'm not against any denomination. Whatever background you're from, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And whatever traditions that you hold, if they draw you closer to him, I'm, I'm for that. But we have to be careful that, you know, and, I, and I'm very careful as a pastor that anything that, that I try to, a direction that we try to follow, the leadership tries to follow, we want it to be based upon God's Word and not upon a personal preference that we have or not because of a, a particular denominational ritual uh, or custom. We want God to be God in this place. We want the Holy Spirit to have His way in this place and to walk in freedom and walk in liberty. I'm going to tell you something that salvation is Jesus plus nothing. You can join every church in Aransas Pass and still not have salvation. You can be baptized. You can speak in tongues. I mean, you can do all the things that churches tell you that you should do to draw closer to him. But I'm telling you, until you become like a little child and you just express that childlike faith in him and say, Lord, I don't understand all this stuff. I, look, I, I'm not a young guy. I look 30. I understand that, but I'm like twice that age. And I've been, around, I've been doing this a long time, and I still don't have all the answers. I'm not even sure I know the questions, all the questions yet. But I'm just telling you, when you just come to him in simple, childlike faith and just say, Lord, I don't understand it all, but I'm going to step out in faith. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to believe you. I, you know, I used to, I used to work with, with children's ministers. I really, I really like that. I like working with kids. They are so much fun. Until they get on my nerves. And then there's going to be a beat down. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, how many, of you, how many of you got spankings when you were little? Anybody? Yeah, I'm going to go out on a limb and say y'all probably didn't get enough. Some of you did not get <laughs> Some of you didn't get enough. Oh, we can't spank kids anymore or whatever and just take away all of our fun as parents. But I'll tell you, <laughs> I'll tell you something, man. Just that, that childlike faith. I used to love because the kids... Sometimes, you know, if you, just, if you just taught, whatever you taught them about God, they just believed it. They didn't, try, they, they didn't try to analyze it and talk themselves out of it. They just believed it in that childlike faith. When God's Word says that He'll save us, He'll save us. When God's Word says He'll bless us, it simply means He'll bless us. 
And the problem is, is that we are suffering from what's called a paralysis of analysis. We are analyzing things to death and experience, just, just instead of experiencing the simplicity of following Jesus. The message sometimes we hear from a lot of churches, a lot of denominations, and from a lot of ministers, their central message is, I'm right. That's the message we hear a lot of times. I'm right. Well, we know the Bible says, I believe it's in John chapter 1, that the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So we stand for the truth. My belief system is not based upon the ever-changing science and philosophies of this world. I mean, you go back, you look at how our values are changing in our American culture over the years, and it's not necessarily for the better. My values and my belief system is based upon God's eternal word. Because Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words. And as a follower of Jesus, the, the word of God is the final authority for my life. I believe that. I believe it's the inspired and errant word of God. Doesn't mean I understand it all. Doesn't mean anybody understands it all. But we walk in the light that we can receive. And I know sometimes people, especially you get in the Old Testament, it's like some of that stuff's pretty rough. And I, I get that. I understand there are a lot of things I don't understand. I don't understand so some of you guys can relate to this. So there was a woman in the Old Testament that there was a king, a, a, a king that was trying to escape. Uh, I believe it was Israel was chasing him, and and uh, she uh, she allowed him to come into her tent. And while he was asleep, she took a, a, a stake and she drove that stake through his head and killed him. How many of you have a wife like that? Can I get? <laughs> how many of you would like to have a wife like that? <laughs> You know, I mean, some of that stuff from the Old Testament, you read is like, wow, that's, that's pretty rough. But you know, in God's Word, let me just share this with you. Whether it's, it's New Testament, Old Testament, obviously we can relate so much more to the New Testament. The Old Testament was God's dealing with the nation of Israel. But even in the Old Testament, you look for the principle that, that's there. I mean, because the customs, you're talking about, you're talking about things that happened three, more than 3,000 years ago in a different time and a different culture. And, and some of it gets lost in translation to a certain extent. And we can't relate. We can't relate to, we can't relate to a, a world of such violence. I mean, you're talking about the Bronze Age and then finally the, the you, you know, ancient times and, and warring factions. And, and it was bloody and it was violent. But look, look, guys, there's some places around the world that are like this. We have missionaries that we support in Africa, that there's some parts of that continent you cannot go to because of the violence. I mean, that, that's just part of the way that the world is, but especially in the Old Testament, you look and there's principles there, and sometimes that principle is on integrity or sometimes it's on obedience. It's there if you look for it, and don't get caught up with all the cultural stuff that happened three or 4,000 years ago. But a lot of churches and a lot of ministers, a lot of pastors, well, I'm right. I'm right. And I think we should also always seek, maybe like these pastors are, we should seek for truth. Turn to somebody this morning, you can't handle the truth. Sorry, that's one of my favorite scenes out of any movie. Go home and watch uh, A Few Good Men or something like that. It'll change your life. But that's one of my favorite scenes. You can't handle the truth. But, you know, a lot of times we can't. We don't want to hear the truth. And I believe that we should, as followers of Jesus, we should pursue truth. But it also says that through Jesus came grace. And that grace means that we demonstrate kindness and love to people that believe differently than we do. You know, I was raised. Uh, I was raised in the Assembly of God Church, and I am not the most famous person to come out of the Assembly of God Church. Elvis actually was. He was a member of First Assembly of God in Memphis in his in his younger days. But you know, as a young as a young man, and I was uh, saying we had this the scene group in our church, and we went to. Uh, we went to Pentecostal churches, we went to Methodist churches, we went to Baptist churches, we sang in a Lutheran gathering one time, that was a little different. So I was exposed to white churches, I, I, was, raised, I was raised in San Antonio, and I'll tell you what, man, there's one thing I found out about San Antonio, they have awesome, San Antonio goes first, they have awesome Mexican food and awesome Hispanic people that love the Lord. And I remember singing in those Spanish churches, and those, those, people, those people would worship God, and some of the black churches we would sing in, and they would worship God. So I, I, I was able to experience so many different church experiences and backgrounds and denominations. And you know what you find out is that there are other people that love Jesus just besides you. There are other people that love Jesus in spite of the fact they might be a different color, different ethnicity, 
They may have less or more money than you, different educational background. They might even vote differently than you, but they love Jesus with all their heart. And I experienced beautiful brothers and sisters in Christ from all different denominations. So we want to stand for truth, but guys, we've got to demonstrate grace. I had a pastor friend of mine tell me one time, but I can't go to that meeting because I don't agree with those churches on their beliefs. And I just say, man, I'll hang out with anybody, anytime, any place. And I, yes, I will stand for truth. And I, you know, I can, I can maintain my personal integrity without being self-righteous and being judgmental and hateful. I can love people. I can demonstrate grace. I mean, I got to do what they're doing, but I can demonstrate grace and I can demonstrate love because that's what Jesus did. His critics tried to discredit him by saying Jesus was a friend of sinners. Woo, aren't you glad he was a friend of sinners? That's hope for you. And there's hope for me because he was a friend of sinners. What does it really mean to be a Christian? Well, you'll get different answers from different denominations sometimes. And a lot of times, and, and, and I was raised sort of in tradition that was similar to this, that you usually would associate becoming a Christian with a sinner's prayer. Amen. How many of you have ever prayed like a sinner's prayer? You were probably raised or you were exposed and maybe raised in that type of church where you would pray the sinner's prayer, they'd lead you. Amen. Some of you need to pray it again, but the, you, got, you got that sinner's prayer where you pray. But you know, the th interesting thing about it, so you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and really even into the book of Acts, and not one time do you see Jesus or the disciples leading somebody in a sinner's prayer. Nothing wrong with it. Don't get me wrong. And if you prayed the sinner's prayer and your life was changed, hallelujah, thank God for that. Your name was written in the book of life. But you know what Jesus' simple message was? Follow me. Because, folks, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of people that will pray that sinner's prayer, but there was, there's never a change in their life. But Paul said this when he wrote to the, the, the Corinthians. He said, if any man's in Christ, he's a new creature. If you're here this morning and you're not sure if you're saved or not, well, you probably aren't. Because if any man's in Christ, he's a new creature. All things pass away and all things become new. Man, I'm so thankful that as a Christian, I don't have a past. <laughs> man, do we have a future. Can I get an amen this morning? <laughs> man, we don't have a past, but man, we have a future. And Paul wrote and said that I have not ear nor uh, I have not seen nor ear heard the things that God has prepared for those that love him. Because our lives are changed, not because we just say a prayer, but because we make the decision that we are going to follow him. Acts chapter 2, Peter, on that day of Pentecost, he's preaching. And he says this, verse 37, or we read this, and now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Peter got up and he was explaining what was happening on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came. And when they heard this, and they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent. You know what repent means? It means to change. It means to change. Change your mind. Change your life. In other words, you're headed one direction, and you change, and you start going the other direction. If any man's in Christ, he's a new creature. Those old things pass away, all things become new, because there's a change that's, that takes place in our life. But it's not a change based upon our keeping the rules or the traditions or the rituals of a church. It's a change that takes place because the Holy Spirit of God comes and lives within us. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man will open up the door, I will come in. And that is what salvation is all about. It's not about just rules. It's not just about rituals. It's not just about traditions. It's about a relationship. The whole thing about Christianity is relationships. Our relationship with God. We love God with all of our heart, our soul, and our might. But we also love each other. Jesus said, by this shall all men know you are my disciples because you have love one for another. That's how, that's how we know. Not how righteous or how sanctified I try to look. I, I remember uh, my... Uh, I was up in Waxahachie. There's a Christian university up there. And my son, he graduated from there. So he's kind of had an interesting, he, uh, he went to a Christian school. Then he, he, he went to the Air Force. And then he got out and he went to a, a Christian university and got a degree in theology. And now he's a Dallas cop. We don't know what the boy's going to pull, what stunt he's going to pull next. But when he was up in school, we were in Waxahachie. And, <laughs> and this man walked in a restaurant we were sitting at. And I, I, I turned to my son and I said, what church does he pastor? I had no idea who the guy was, but you know how I knew that? 
because of his hairdo. (laughs) Now, wait a second, folks. I am follically challenged here, so I can't get that preacher hairdo going. But this guy, he had it going on. He had that preacher hairdo, and I said, said, "Which did he say?" Oh no, he did. He's he's not a pastor. He's actually a uh, he's a professor at the school I go to. (laughs) Well, you know, Jesus didn't say, "By your hairdo shall all men know you're my disciples." He said, "By love." And let that be said of us, that we may not understand it all, we may not agree with each other on every point, but let us always demonstrate grace. Let me tell you something. If I do something and I mess up, which happens just about every day, you can judge me if you want to. I I would appreciate if you'd pray for me. You know why? Because he's not finished with me yet. And he's not finished with you yet. He's not finished with us. So let's demonstrate love and grace to each other. And when somebody, when somebody has fallen down, let's not go and kick them while they're down like a lot of good Christian folks do. Let's reach down and let's try to help them get back up. And let's help them dust off and get back on the road that they need to be. Let's restore each other. Let's love each other. Let's walk in grace. Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Problem is, we can overcomplicate the Christian life. I have a good friend of my pastor in this area, and he is, I mean, he's one of the smartest people I know. Uh, he was like me. He had a vocation before, and then he retired, and, and he, went, he went to seminary. And a lot of times, I will have questions, and I will call him, and just to get his perspective, he's from a different denomination or a different tradition than I am. And I love talking to him. Brilliant guy. And we were talking about seminary one time and, and uh, I told him, and because I, 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 we like to give each other a hard time. And I said, hey, you know what, you know what cemetery, uh, cemetery, you know what seminary is, same thing sometimes. You know what the seminary is really about, all about? You know what the purpose of seminary is? He said, no, and he was very interested in what I had to say then. And he, he said, no, what is seminary all about? I said, seminary is where people go to learn to answer questions that nobody's asking. <laughs> and I have, I have sat with extremely educated people, and they will get on topics, and they are splitting hairs on so many different d- d- doctrines and everything, and, and they kind of lose me. They kind of lose me a little bit. I tried to watch this uh, YouTube video one time of these four PhDs, and they were sp- you know, they were just like going through and they were splitting hairs and they were examining under the microscope and pulling out original Bible languages, talking about the end times. And, and it was just, you know, after about an hour and a half, I said, I can't, I can't watch this anymore. I mean, all of them brilliant. All of them had an opinion. And that, that's what can happen a lot. We can just overcomplicate things and make this so difficult. It's about following Jesus. It's about having a relationship with him. And church is here so we can encourage each other. And we have some that are coming. We have some that'll millions that'll watch by my, I'm saying that by faith, millions that'll watch the YouTube channel later. And you know what? They're part of the church family also. But the church is here so we can encourage each other and we can bless each other and help each other be strong in our faith. So when you go back and you try to figure out, well, what was the plan? What was God's plan for man all along? Genesis chapter 3, verse 8 says this. So you go back, you go back to the very beginning, and this was God's plan for his relationship with mankind. Genesis chapter 3, verse 8 says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. It's talking about Adam and Eve. And the man and the wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Adam and Eve had sinned. And you see that beautiful, to me, it's a beautiful picture of God coming down in the garden in the cool of the evening. There were no rituals. There were no traditions. They didn't have to say Hail Marys. They didn't have to do the sign of the cross. They didn't have to baptize in water. They didn't have to learn the rules of a church. They didn't have to learn all these traditions. They were, Adam and Eve weren't burdened down by all those things. And, and, and look, we don't, know, we don't know how long that Adam and Eve, you read it and it's like, you know, they were in the garden one day, they sinned the next. They may, have, they may have been in the garden for thousands of years. We really don't know how far back that goes because the Bible does not date that for us. But, you know, they had a beautiful relationship with God that he came down in the cool of the evening and he just walked with them. Just think the simplicity of following him, the simplicity of having a relationship with him. We know that water baptism and communion are very important. 
Jesus instituted communion at the Last Supper. And we know water baptism is, is very important. And there's some of you here today, I still need to dunk you in that water. Don't worry. I will dunk you. And if I like you, I'll bring you back up. And if not, go with God. <laughs> But, you know, we should be baptized in water. And that's really the two traditions that we follow because Jesus instituted Holy Communion. He said, do this, do this until I return. And water baptism is just an outward sign of an inward work that you're saying, hey, I'm a follower of Jesus. Because there really, aren't any, there really isn't any such thing as a private follower of Jesus. You, you have to follow him and you have to be open and you have to, you, you have to allow people to see Jesus in you. Understand that it's Jesus that saves, not churches. Churches don't save. Churches don't heal. Churches don't deliver. Churches don't set the captives free. But Jesus is the one that sets the captive free. Jesus is the one that changes our life. Jesus is the one that comes into our life and establishes a relationship. Understand it's all about relationships. Let me close. Can I get an amen now? Some of you haven't said amen all morning. Now just say amen on that. You know, the name, the name that, that Jesus used, about God more than any other name was an Aramaic, uh, Aramaic name or term, Abba, which means Father. Jesus revealed God to us as a Father. And I realize that in, in contemporary culture, society, because of uh, sometimes people's backgrounds, sometimes people's experiences in their family life, they don't associate the term Father it's, it's not something, it's not a pleasant term. It's not something that they, they associate with a pleasant experience. Maybe an abusive father, an abusive stepfather, something like that. But Jesus demonstrated a father that loved us so much that Jesus said that he loves us so much that there's not anything he wouldn't do for us. He said, if you being evil know how to give good things to your children, how much more will your heavenly father... Jesus revealed God to us as a heavenly father that loves us so much, that is perfect and is kind and is gracious. James, who is a half-brother of our Lord, said that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. The good things, some of you this morning have so many good things in your life, and sometimes we're more aware of our problems than we are of our blessings. I talked recently in a series we were doing about having a, a gratitude journal or having a list of blessings and, and every day writing down a couple of blessings. And, and you know what? You'll be stunned and surprised by how many blessings that you have in your life. But many times we are focused on our problems and our difficulties and maybe that one area of our life that we're struggling with. Man, get your eyes off of that and get your eyes on Jesus. Don't seek a healing. Seek the healer this morning. Don't seek the answer. Seek the one who gives the answer. Get your eyes upon him today. And you'll find that he'll meet every need according to his riches and glory. So I want us to just follow him in the simplicity of walking in his love and in his grace. And you don't, you don't have to be bound by all the rituals and all the things that churches will put on you. And listen, I'm for every church that loves Jesus. And whatever their traditions are, whatever, whatever their rituals are, I'm not, I'm not criticizing that. Please understand what I'm saying. But you can follow all the rules of the church and you can be broken and empty and defeated because it's when we come into that relationship with him that our life is changed and he gives us hope and a reason for living. Father, we just thank you so much. Jesus, as you said, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Father, thank you for your grace and your mercy and your love. And Father, I just pray today, Lord, for any that are here this morning that maybe they have never really surrendered their life to you. And Father, I pray that they would make the decision now that I'm going to follow him. And Father, I pray, Lord, for those in our church family that are, that are struggling with physical problems and, and those that maybe have some other need in their life. We're, we're thankful, God, that your grace is sufficient in every trial and every storm. Father, meet every need according to your riches and glory. By Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let me just say this in dismissing, if you, uh, if you want to make a decision to follow him, we have, not on the back table, we've got Bibles back there. Grab a Bible, grab a coffee cup. There's also a little booklet, What Now? And if you're new to the faith and you're trying to get a good foundation for your new faith, grab one of those little booklets. It's not, it's, you know, it's not propaganda, it's just helping you uh, and, and Bible verses and stuff like that to help you get started. Thank you so much for being here today. God bless you.